Welcome to another episode of Sports and Songs Podcast. We're your hosts, Dan and Andy. Today is season four, episode number 35 today, Andy. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How about you? Good. We're on all star, all star break week right now. The break, the yeah. week is going, you know, everything's shut down for baseball. It's one of the few days in all of the 365 days in sports that there's not one single four of the pro sport leagues going on. WNBA is even off tonight. They are. Yeah. Well, we're on episode 35. Tonight is a sports edition. Today is July 10th, 2023, and we've got some uh, little Major League draft, little uh, all-star game information, mm-hmm. baseball things. We're not going to cover the celebrity softball tournament. I know you're excited mm-hmm. about that, Andy. No, yeah, no I, I'm sorry. Yeah. We'll talk a little baseball, and uh, we're at the midway part of the year, um, including the minor leagues, the major leagues. We've got some amateur baseball to talk about. College it's gonna football. Be, it's going to be, yes, NFL training camp is going to be reporting uh, dates here in a couple of weeks. I yeah, think. yeah. Less than two weeks. All right, let's start off with the trivia question relating to sports. All right, go ahead. Do you remember as a kid the television series The Baseball Bunch? Funny you should mention that, yes. The Baseball Bunch. Uh, was a 30 minute show that talked kind of educational about young youngsters. It was on in the early 80s. Uh, how many seasons for the trivia question now? How many seasons did that air on television? It was a 30 minute show during the baseball season, or maybe was it just during the summertime? I'm not sure, but yeah, it was 30 minutes in the summer. How many seasons did the baseball bunch air back in the day? Johnny Bench was uh, involved. And you're not counting the when it was rerun on ESPN and TBS. No, no just, just how many seasons? And um, that was good. You know, you and I were at that age where we watched uh, all the episodes. I'm sure that was very pivotal to me becoming a baseball fan. Was that show pivotal? Keyword pivotal. Yes, it was good. And I think Major League Baseball did it to get more kids interested in, into the sport. Maybe I don't know what it was, but it was it was done to the demographic was to get kids into the game girls got boys. Me more into baseball got me more into baseball and got me to hate mascots even more with the chicken on there san diego chicken was a main character on that yes my despise for mascots grew with that show uh the, and the reason to bring it up they did a a skit uh i saw the the segment with ted williams yes floating around the internet uh this last week and i thought that was good and so we thought that'd be the trivia question for today so how many seasons did the show okay. Baseball Bunch Air, and we'll get to the answer at the end All right. of the episode. <clears throat> we'll bring up the episode. Here we go. Here we go. As I've started, WNBA is off today. Um, they're about midway through. they got their All-Star game coming up. So it's kind of here's a nice chance to update the standings for the Women's National Basketball Association. In the East, of course, we'll start the East because, like all other sports shows, we have to show that East Coast favoritism. So we have to do the East first. Okay. The Liberty first, uh, the Connecticut Sun, those are kind of the two powerhouse teams in the league. One, two. New York Chicago, who had missed a chance, but they had a good draft. Watch for them. And Indiana Fever last. There's the West. There's the Lynx. They're up to third. They started out awful to start the year. They're up to nine and ten now in the year. Okay. Making some noise, so watch out for the local girls. Uh, the, women. Uh, women. Sparks. What? Uh, that'd be women. Yes, women. Uh, the the girls. High school, yes, is girls and boys. In college, it's uh, in pros, men and women. Even though they're trying to change that now for a local high school track and field, it's when women and men, they call it now, for high school. Yeah. I don't, uh, I'm not a big fan. And there's the Sparks in fourth. They should have kept Monica. That's why they're doing bad. Yes, you've got uh, a grudge. you got a chip on yeah, your shoulder. Yeah, well, I'm bitter. I'm bitter. So NCAA news, Dan. Some uh, stuff on the NCAA college sports here. Uh, it was said earlier that Bob Huskins was going to resign, and now he's saying he's going to sue that he never claimed he was going to resign. So we'll see what's going on with all that. <laughs> oh, Awkward. Northwestern, Pat Fitzgerald, the coach, is suspended for two games because of hazing. Here's from the Northwestern or DailyNorthwestern.com. Former player said he reported his experience to the North to the university in late November 22. He alleges that much of the team's hazing centered around a practice dubbed 
running, which was used to punish team members, primarily freshmen, for making mistakes on the field and in practice. If a player was selected for running, the player who spoke to the Daily News said they'd be restrained by a group of 8 to 10 upperclassmen dressed in various purge-like masks, who would then begin dry-humping the victim in a dark locker. Um, I see that has nothing to do with running. Maybe get, the guy wants to run away. Now, I can see if they made him running run, away. Very I, creepy. If you made him run laps afterwards, I'd get that, and that's not really hazing. That's just something you got to do. They kind of took it a little too far there at, at the Northwestern. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Those private schools, you can't trust them. From our guys in the research department. Perfect. There they are. Gosh. <laughs> oh, man. That is awful. <laughs> our boy Nick has become the 72nd player to hit a home run against all 32 teams. All 30. There are 30 teams, 72nd wow. player. Wow, 72nd guy to do it. Now, this is one of those stats that kind of bother me because A, players get traded a lot more. It's not like back in the day where you played with your one team and that was it. So it was hard, harder to do. But now guys are flopping teams. You hit home running against all 30 teams. Interleague, Good. everything. Doesn't mean you're a home run hitter. just means you've got one against every team and you've had a long career. Good for you, young man. Good for you. Continuing on with stats that annoy me this week. Yeah, it's a it's it's an impressive stat, but it's not you know yeah, really all that impressive. Nothing to get a trophy over. Otani became the first player to reach base four plus times, hit two plus home runs, and strike out ten plus batters in a game since 1890. I'm wow. getting sick and tired of all these stats of his because he's only got to do it since the late 1800s, early 1900s. So it's not like we've always had a player all these years doing it. I'm kind of getting sick and tired of all these stats going, he's the first guy in 100 years to do it. Because no one else ever did. Yeah. It wasn't a thing. Yes, the they National were League. essentially prohibited from doing it. You didn't have the option. Yeah, the National League pitchers batted, don't get me wrong, but once a week, and they were pulled after the second inning or they were told to sacrifice all the time. So I'm so over his stat. Not saying he's a bad player. I'm just sick and tired of hearing about it. Yep. That should have been a soapbox. That should have been a – that's a good soapbox yeah, right there. I got back-to-bat uh, Teddy stats here. Joe DiMaggio, during his hitting streak, batted 408. Ted Williams, during that same time, batted 412. Jeez. <laughs> oh, my God. Ted's numbers were better. Than, he didn't hit in 56 consecutive games. So, uh, oh, well. That's a great stat. And here's – speaking of the man – Ted Williams, <clears throat> excuse me, Ted Williams left Major League Baseball to serve in World War II and Korea. He hit 406 and 41 and won the Triple Crown in 42. He served in the Marines in 43, 44, and 45. Came back in 46 to win the MVP. Missed the majority of 52, 53 season while serving Korea, where he became a war hero. How, how could, I mean, sorry, just you would never see this in players today. No, no. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, just with the injuries in today's game alone and people getting yep, hurt yep. and taking time off. Well, I got a he comes back days off. after three seasons. That's an eternity in Major League Baseball. Yep. And wins the MVP. Comes back as the MVP, yeah. Now, he didn't win. He did not win. This is not the Comeback Player of the Year award. No, he was no. the MVP. The MVP, yeah. Wow. Yep. yep. All right, now for the official 80s stat of the week. Okay, I like this. Michael Jack Schmidt became the first retired player voted to start an All-Star game. Okay, say that again. He was the first retired player to vote to start because that happened. But a week or two in the season, he said, you know what, I'm going to retire. Well, the season already started. He was on the ballot. Kind of got the sympathy vote in a way. I'm not a Phillies guy. I'm not a Mike Schmidt guy. This was okay. not a PR move on his part. It wasn't a glory hound move on his part. He just decided it wasn't. It's not going to work that, out. And once again, not to play, 
he was voted to start. I mean, yeah, that is unreal. Well, and you think about any sport, though, in a way, a, a great player like him starts the year and says, you know what, I'm going to hang it up. And it's a thing where the fans vote. Oh, yeah, he's going to be starting. I don't care what sport you're talking about. Yeah. You know, it, he very well could have made it as a starter anyway, just because of his name and reputation, the way the all star ballot goes. Sure. But he retired and went on. It's like, not a fan of his, but he was a great player. I will give him that. More, if you recognize where that more came from, the cigarette. That's right. Yes. On this day, July 2nd, 1993, Philadelphia Veterans Stadium. The latest game in Major League history ended at 4.40 a.m. as relief pitcher Mitch Williams, in his first at-bat of the season, singles home winning run in the 10th inning, given the Phillies a 6-5 victory over the Padres. The game started at 1.26 a.m. to do three rain delays in game one of a twin bill. It flips three and a half hour. Three hours and 35-minute mark established by the, in Atlanta July 4th of 85 in a game with fireworks after the Mets beat the Braves in 19 innings, 16-13. About that Mets game, the Mets-Braves game. Okay. Lots of different things. And, again, I'm not saying this because he's my hero. He's my man. Gary Carter caught all 19 innings. Oh, my. Now that and now is something think, you would never see today. And think of this, boys and girls. This was 1985 when the catcher actually crouched. They didn't sit on one knee for every pitch. They didn't have the knee saver pads. Yeah, they didn't have the, the things behind the thighs or you're on one knee to rest for all pitches. He was crouched 19 innings. Well. And he's the one who started the rally in the 19th inning for the win. So. Wow. So, yeah, look that game up. The stats on that one. Holy cow. April 1st, 1980, or July 1st, 85, Bruce Bochy hits a walk-off home run off Nolan Ryan and a 6-5 Padres win. It's the only walk-off dinger Ryan ever allowed in 807 appearances. Okay, so only one ever, ever. Yeah. <clears throat> and he had a lot. This is back when those guys won a lot of complete games, so it wasn't like, well, starters don't get that stat very often anymore. They pitched complete games, so. And Bruce Bochy, manager extraordinaire nowadays. So there's a stat for you. Yeah, I like him. Canadian baseball stat of the week. Kind of a trivia question. The Edward Julian. This is the only time a baseball game was played without the American National Anthem because it was the Expos against the Blue Jays 26 years ago, June 30th. Expos won the game 2-1. to one. Highlights in that game. Okay. Pedro Martinez against Pat Henkin pitched. Complete games. Carlos Delgado and Vlad Sr. each at home runs. The game lasted two hours and three minutes. Two to one game. This was 20 seconds. So before pitch clocks and everything else, two hours and three minutes. It, that moved along very quick. Man, both teams there in the opposite leagues never to face each other at all. And both pitchers went complete games. So there. Wow. That's how you get it. That's, That's a good stat. Started. The Mets, got to talk about the elephant in the room here. Here we go, my boys. Okay. First of all, July 9th, 1973, during a pregame team meeting with Mets chairman and board M. Donald Grant, Tug McGraw jumps up and yells, you got to believe. The Mets go 47-33 and 33 the rest of the season, to clinch the division title and the pennant. Tug McGraw, now who's his kid? Uh, Tim McGraw, the country singer. Oh, yes, yes. The one married to Faith Hill. Who Tim McGraw. Who so that's the old man there. That's his dad. Yeah, and Tug. Faith Hill needs to eat a sandwich real bad. She's kind of thin. Um, but the Mets, if you look at all the sides, you got to believe in 73. And, yes, yes, they lost to the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series, but it could be done. you got to believe. Tug was a character. Tug McGraw had a great quote. He goes, what do you think artificial grass? He goes, I don't know. I've never smoked artificial grass. <laughs> So that was Tug for you. Yeah, one of the good guys. Mets didn't make a trade this week. Close, well, not close person from the show or me, but guy on my fantasy team. Delano's own Zach Meckenhern was traded to the Seattle Mariners. 
back on the third um, for Trevor Gott and Chris Flexen. Uh, Flexen has sent, uh, been sent for assignment, and uh, they released him then two days later. But Gott is up on the big squad for the Mets. Zach is in the minors for the Mariners right now. So that's how it's okay. going. Um, parts of the deal, the, you know, Zach was called up three times. Why would you do that? A lot of it had to do with financial stuff. Um, Zach's a great play, pitcher um, at AAA Syracuse. Zach has see, was seen results allowing three runs and 30 and two-thirds innings, good for a .88 ERA. 15.7% strikeout rate. Doesn't jump off the page, but his 10.7% walk rate stood out. He's also thrived in surpassing runs by keeping the ball on the ground at 50% rate. So, uh, just from what I heard, a lot of things with the Mets is the way they're going right now. They're not being buyers or sellers, but they're looking for someone now, not someone in a year or two. So, okay. Tyler like has done that in financial reasons. So, uh, wishing well to Zach. He's still on my minor league team. Delano's on his own, Zach. Where is Zach from? Is he Delano? Delano, Minnesota, Delano High School. And uh, he's a, um, a Sioux. He went to the University of North Dakota for college. Okay. Kept it all local. Most home runs by a catcher. There's our boy Francisco Alvarez at 15. Home runs before 21 years of age. Johnny Bench is on there twice. Wow. Now. Back to back. Francisco did start. He got called up late. First couple weeks were kind of bad, but he's really kicked it around. Which points the question. Do you move him to first base or the outfield next year? Help his career out if he's going to be a good power hitter? Do you let him sit behind the plate and get beat up? Now, granted, catchers don't get beat up like you know Gary Carter and Mike Sosha and Johnny Bench did back in the day. But if you look at your history, Bryce Harper came up as a catcher. And right away. You know, so that's the thing. If he's going to be this good, Pete Alonzo, who's in the All-Star game for some ungodly reason with his 210 batting average but can hit home runs, do you make Pete Alonzo accessible, tradable at the end of the year, and move Francisco to first? Do you let him sit behind the plate? Because the, the pitchers love him, so what do you do? That's really the question this offseason for Mets fans. Okay. Watch the trade wires and what comes up on that. Bison. I got Bison news, Dan. I'm talking Bison right. football. I'll jot this down. I'll jot, I'm will i jotting down some notes here as we go. Yes, for our, for our friend Craig. See, he thinks he's a little small schools. We're talking small school football. Oh, yeah. Bison or bust. The Mountain West should pursue the North Dakota State Bison because San Diego State's leaving. The Mountain West Conference soon be – Short of its marquee members, San Diego State sent conference a letter last week indicating that they want to leave in the end of 2024, asking for lenience to exit fees. League officials confirmed in the Idaho statement last week, after the news was reported by ESPN, that San Diego State Tribune Union and everywhere else, citing anonymous sources. Um, They'd have to pay, what's the number here, in the bylaws, $17 million to get out of their contract with them. North Dakota State, concerned with the strongest teams in the FCS. Uh, they got the Fargo Dome, so for those northern schools to come over and play, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, just imagine the Bison. They're green and gold playing on the blue Smurf turf at Boise State. Wow. Or Wyoming with the Brown down there playing down there. Cowboys. Um, North Dakota State feels like a program that should be invited to join the Mountain West. They tried years ago. The Bison are cut from the same blue-collar mold as Boise State, Wyoming, and Air Force, and there's much more to accomplish at, at the FCS level. The Bison have won 103 games since 2015, nine national championships since 2011, and they've produced 11 NFL draft picks since 2014, including – Two number one or two top three draft picks for quarterback and Carson Wentz and Trey Lance. Also, the Bison, the basketball team has been playing in the Summit League and they've made the tournament a couple of years recently. Uh, James Madison was the last team to make the jump and they won eight and three in their first season in the Sun Belt. So the Bison can do it. 
Okay. Um, That's an interesting year. topic. Yep. Appalachian State, uh, Georgia Southern, Coastal Carolina, and Liberty have also moved to FBS in recent years. Like I said, the men's basketball team has been playing Summit since 2009. Uh, and North Dakota State would be busy investing in teams. The football program opened a new – now this is you know, what they say, the quote, quote, small schools – opened a $54 million practice facility last year. Jeez. In all, NDSU has invested $110 million in facility upgrades over the past decade. But they're a small school. Remember, they don't count. Yep. That's an interesting dilemma there. Tennessee State, a member of the HBCU Historically Black College Universities, are going to play D1 hockey. Oh, interesting. I did not know this. This is coming up new here. Uh, Tennessee State University set to make history by becoming the first historically black college or university to offer men's hockey at a collegiate level. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this politically incorrectly probably because of who I am. National Predators, National Tennessee, they draw very well. Hockey's a big draw down there. There is only a dozen African-American players in the NHL, and a lot of them played in Nashville. So without sounding like Jimmy the Greek or someone else, the black audience has been drawn to that team to watch the black players there. Therefore, there's an interest and a thirst for it. Therefore, Tennessee State is jumping on that popularity, that itch, that, hey, we like hockey. You know, everybody likes hockey down here. Let's get a team and play. So and those are just my numbers, that, but there are reasoning behind it, why they do it. I mean, you look at – okay, that's like saying Iowa for girls basketball right now. As well as that college team is doing – They'd be like, I would get a WNBA team all of a sudden. Well, because the college team's doing well in drawing fans. The hockey team's drawing fans on there, drawing from everybody, from people, not just boys or girls or whites or blacks or blues or greens or left-handed people or whatever. They're drawn from everybody. And so they're going to jump on that while it's hot and see if they get a team down there. And oh. I say, good luck. I would love to see hockey down in Tennessee, see it expand more. Look how big it is in Florida. Oh, sure. Uh, Alabama, there's a team in Alabama for Division One hockey. So there's a rivalry for you right off the bat, kind of local. So good luck to them. Wow. Some local news. You know, we got to do that local news. At the All-Star game, a couple of gophers in Seattle this weekend. Dan Wilson, former gopher, former Seattle Mariner catcher. And now works for the Mariners in their Hall of Fame. And J.P. Mozzie, former gopher, who's right now playing at uh, the High A affiliate for the Pirates, the Greensboro Grasshoppers. He's there. Okay. The, uh, futures game. So a couple gophers sitting there at the All-Star game. That's kind of nice to see. Wow. And your homework. All right. I've got a pen and paper, number two pencil here, sharpened. Kind of bouncing off your thing. The baseball bunch, we talked about it. It's Tommy Lasorda was the wizard. Of course, I threw a Gary Carter picture in there. Um, oh, yes. And the chicken. So there we go. And you think, oh, Johnny Bench probably had a lot of Reds players on there because he's buddies with them. Sure. But, again, he had Gary Carter on. And he had all these guys on, too. Now, you look at the names on here. Joe Gargiola, Ted Williams, Dan Quisenberry, Jim Rice. Um, Pete Rose, Davey Lopes, Gary Carter. The one name on here, the episode I want to go back and watch, Al Herboski, the Mad Hungarian. Oh, yes. That had to be a – that's one I want to see. I would like to see that as well, yes. I wanna, I'd have to go back on my YouTube machine and dig that one up. That Tug McGraw was on there. Don Manley had to be a very young Don Manley coming in. Um, you know, Sparky Anderson, Dusty Baker. List was on. So these were all star players. He wasn't just getting the hey, can you know, Steve Lombardozzi come be on our show? No, they didn't want Steve Lombardozzi. These are all stars that were on the show. So my homework question is if next year they're going to start the show, who would you want your host to be? Uh, who would the host with, be for the baseball with, bunch in today's world? I came up with Miguel Cabrera. 
Oh, yes. He's retiring this year, so he's still got an itch with some of these guys or you'll be familiar with them. Guys who maybe recently retired, he still knows from playing with them. He's got a great personality. Fun-loving, so I could see him doing it. Or Craig Biggio is my other guess. And the only reason I say Craig Biggio is he played catcher, second, and outfield. So he can kind of help all over. And I wasn't going to say Ron Darling, but he doesn't have the free time. I think he's doing too much other stuff all the time. No. That is good. That is a good list there. And one more thing. You always got to have one more thing, Dan. Yes. This is just a great, great quote from Bob Cousy, former basketball player for the Celtics. Who gives a darn if we played plumber if we played plumbers and firefighters? At least we didn't play against a bunch of TikTok dancers and Twitch streamers. We played against men. <laughs> Old awesome. guys rule. You go. Awesome. Bob. That's great. So that's that, sir. That's my uh, fifteen minutes of fame for the week, right there. Well, we've got, you know, we got the All Star break coming up. You know, the All Star game coming up uh, as well. But we yeah. also have minor league baseball, Andy. Minor league baseball's in its break. Yes, I did a little homework. It came up with the top teams in AAA only. So AAA okay. is the highest level of farm system before they reach the majors. And here's the. The top teams right now, the top teams in all of all of AAA is okay. All 30 teams of their affiliates of Major League Baseball and down in AAA, the top number of teams with wins. Round Rock Rangers and the Minnesota Twins, uh, St. Paul Saints, they're tied at 52 in third place. Orioles up there with 55. Dodgers in first place with 57. These are the teams uh, that are potentially up there with the possibility to win 100 games this season in the minors. Tough thing to do. But typically you think of this list and you think of young guys, uh, athletic prospects coming up. And then you look at the St. Paul Saints Twins affiliate, which is mainly filled with veterans on that team. Right. Um, there's not like surprising young guys ready to come up here. It's mainly filled up with uh, over the offseason. They picked up all these uh, veteran players for the Twins, and then they're shifting them back and forth between AAA and stuff. So, there are a lot of household names playing for the Saints, and I think that's why they're that good, of course. It's not uh, you know naturally young, gifted athletes coming up, but a lot of veteran guys. Dallas Keuchel is a pitcher yep. for the Saints, and so they got guys like that. Yeah, But the second half should be very interesting once the season rolls in because before you know it, it's going to be playoff, uh, the playoff push, as they well, say. And the Dodgers being up there, it's weird because everybody associates the Dodgers with, oh, they just buy players to win the division all the time. They got the best minor league team in AAA right now. You know, very good. Orioles as well. You know, the or Orioles should be good for a while now. They're good. Yep, yep. Same Major with the Rangers. AAA. The Rangers, same thing. They got management there with Bruce Bochy, as mentioned earlier. So they they got it going. Good stuff. Fun time of the year here to wrap up. You know, amateur baseball is down to I think a week or two left of the regular season, Andy. Yep, and it's going to start. Sectionals going to be kicking into high gear, and the all and the state tournament. We just had the the All Star, the North was it the North Star League against the Coral River Valley yep. League All Star game was last week. Uh, some of these fun things. One run uh, game, North Star League the, wins by one. The over thirty five, uh, the Federal League is they'll be wrapping up their season at the end of end of July. A lot of the over fifty leagues. Yeah, are just getting um, really underway now uh, here in July. They start later, but they run through September. So it runs later in the season, but those teams uh, just getting underway. One more thing before you give the answer, one more thing about uh, town ball stuff going on. This Saturday here in the Watertown, friend of the show, Jeremy Quas, The Rock. The Rock. Doing the 999 Challenge. All proceeds are going to the uh, Red Devils uh, scholarship fund. We are sponsoring him in it. Uh, the, the 999 challenge, you say. What, what is that, Andy? Well, let me tell you. Nine hot dogs, nine beers, nine innings. Simple math. It's a challenge. <clears throat> He's going to try it. He's going to give it a shot. Good luck to him. We will be there cheering him on, supporting him. 
giving away free autographs with a donation to the scholarship fund. It should be interesting to see that take place. Uh, they're trying to Jeremy's trying to get um, the super fan uh, of mm -hmm. each of these teams to come out yep. and, and each of the teams to be to have their themselves a <clears throat> super fan, much like he is for the Watertown Red Devils. Yep. Other teams could have a super fan and do some of these gimmicks like this, but it'll be fun to watch this. I've never seen it done myself. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be for the Pro River League. If you're a super fan for the Federal League, the North Star League, let us know. We'll have you on. Uh, you know, pimp your team, cheer them on, rah, rah, rah. And uh, what, what can you do to support your team? Fun like this. There's all sorts of things that uh, that teams do. Um, but this this will be a fun activity. That's, that's Saturday. We'll report on yep. it, of course, on Monday night. Yes, yeah, so we'll have pictures online. But the trivia answer, sir. Trivia answer is the Baseball Bunch, a 30-minute television show geared towards children, uh, sponsored by Major League Baseball. It ran for how many seasons, Andy? How many do you think? Five. Yes. You are correct. I thought it ran for two or three seasons, but it ran for five seasons. That's why they had all those guest stars on there. Yeah, and those kids kept rotating. It wasn't the same. I was reading one kid on there kind of had to leave because – he had a growth spurt, and he was taller than Johnny Bench. So, <laughs> well, they did. They had so they watched the little kids. So they each year they had a cast uh, of the yep. of the kids, all with different names of roles they played. They weren't yep. even Some the real came names. Came back for two years. They were little enough, but uh, one kid got taller than Johnny Bench, and so they said Maybe that he didn't. He had to go bye bye then. So yeah, which was oh. not a complaint. It was just it was geared to younger kids, not the high school age kids or bigger kids. You know, so. All right, we'll see you all next week. Have a good week. Uh, let us know if any uh, recommendations and, and things to follow for future episodes. episodes. Like, share, and subscribe. All right, see ya. Bye.